Well, good morning, and welcome once again to Word for the Week, our online book study here at Cornerstone Faith Community Church as we continue to work our way through uh, Jerry Bridges' book, The Discipline of Grace. I'm very excited to be with you again uh, today. My name is Pastor Jeremy Heidkem, and I'm the senior pastor here at Cornerstone Faith Community Church, and uh, we are in chapter 6 of Bridges' book today where he is talking about the idea of being transformed into likeness, into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Um, He begins chapter 6 by quoting uh, from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. If you have your books in front of you, you can read it there. If you want to grab your Bible and read it there as well. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, Paul writes these words. He says, But we all, with unveiled face... Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as the Lord, the Spirit. Um, What Paul is saying here is that all of us, as we uh, seek to follow, uh, first of all, as we seek to love God, uh, as we seek to submit ourselves to Him, as we seek to uh, follow the spirit that he has given us as our guide, as we seek to uh, live as Christ Jesus lived and set an example for us, um, all of us in that process of doing all those things, being all those things, um, we are having our eyes opened, our faces more and more unveiled towards who God is. And so we are beginning uh, or we are continuing to walk through this process that began uh, what Paul says at one piece of glory or one state of glory and will end at yet another place of glory. That first place of glory, of course, is it began with our birth, really, and ultimately at, it begins with our conversion, our, our new birth into God, into Christ Jesus as we um, were, as we began accepted Christ Jesus as our own personal Savior and as we uh, and as we expect accepted the truth of who God is and the gospel for us that's the first glory and then the second glory of course is when we are united with him forever when we um, are, are are captured up with Christ Jesus uh, for all of eternity um, that will be the the second glory living with him forever in heaven and so Paul says but we are all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. We are being transformed into the same image, the same image of the glory of the Lord, from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Um, I want to try to help you make sense a little bit of chapter 6. This is a, another one of those deeply theological um, chapters. Uh, there's a lot of big words uh, that he throws out uh, in this particular chapter. He calls them... Um, uh, He calls them uh, eight-cylinder words. That is the word I'm looking for. Eight-cylinder words. Um, They're big words like regeneration, sanctification, justification, um, transformation. Uh, These are, are, are big, big words in the world of theology, things that the church has argued about and, and disagreed about and, and, uh, and unfortunately drawn lines in the sand over throughout history. And, and today I want to just kind of help you understand these words uh, a little bit better. And so I'm going to begin where he begins, where Bridges begins, with the word uh, regeneration. At the um, bottom of page 88 in Bridges' book, he says, uh, Sanctification actually begins at the time of our conversion. We just talked about that. When we have finally fully trusted Jesus as our own personal Savior, Um, when by an act called regeneration or the new birth, the principle of spiritual life is planted within us. Um, Later on, Bridges says that regeneration is like a new start. Um, We might say it's like having a do-over or or, or a a fresh start. Um, What's interesting to me is if we think about regeneration in terms of a plant, Okay. Um, if a plant grows, uh, if it starts out as a seed and it sprouts and that sprout grows up and it grows in and it flowers and it becomes a beautiful plant, um, that plant will keep 
growing and keep living so long as uh, several things happen. First, it receives the amount of water it needs to live. Secondly, it receives the uh, nutrients it needs to live. And thirdly, that um, it receives the, the proper amount of sunshine, heat, um, or cold, whatever the case might be. Uh, and so uh, this idea of the flower is that it started from a seed and it grew up into a plant. Now, imagine if we stopped watering that plant or if there was no rain or if there, uh, you know, some other thing happened. If that plant just shrivels up and dies uh, to the point where it is no longer alive. Now, let's say we, we take that plant out of that uh, pot and it is I mean, it is toast. There isn't a bit of green left in it. The roots are all dried up and shriveled. If we take that plant and we put it in uh, a new pot and we suddenly begin to water it, water it, water it, uh, what are the chances it's going to turn green? Very slim, very slim. I suppose there are some instances where uh, plants can do that, where they can be resurrected, if you will. Um, but the reality is once it's reached its, its death point, that plant isn't going to come back. Now, the problem with regeneration is when we think about that plant, regeneration almost seems to suggest that that dead plant gets put back into the ground and it's watered and it's nourished and it's cared for and it starts to become green again. Um, interestingly enough, I would say this, rather than utilizing the, the, the image of a plant for, for talking about regeneration, I actually want to talk about something that uh, happens happened in my life that I think uh, I just recently realized was an example of regeneration. Uh, it's kind of a strange and funny thing. So when I was a little kid, um, the first Nintendos came out, The what was called the NES, the Nintendo Entertainment System, and it was a big deal. It was the biggest deal in terms of video games uh, uh, to come out uh, since our Atari came out in the 70s. And so when the NES came out, there was a whole series of games call, uh, about Super Mario, uh, Mario and Super Mario. And you played these little characters, Mario and Luigi, and you were playing them through these different worlds. Now, as you went and you succeeded in a particular world, you went into the next world, and each world got a little more complex, a little more difficult, a little harder. And uh, I have never been good at video games. I still am not. And so there was always a level at which those games became impossible for me. I just don't understand how to, to play them. I, I'm not gifted in that way. I, can't, I could never figure them out. And so I would always be able to play those games up to a certain point, and then I, I, I couldn't do anything. I just kept dying, 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 dying. Well, what's interesting about these Mario games, and actually video games as a whole, is that oftentimes um, you get to have the opportunity to start over. So um, one, of the, one of the coolest things that came out with the Nintendo a little bit later on in other systems was that you could restart that level that you were on from, from, from that point. In previous games, when you died, you had to start the whole game all over again. But as the game kind of went, uh, as technology increased, all of a sudden you could start over from the part where you had died previously. You didn't lose all the work you had done. Um, that was always a good thing for me because I was always, always, always in need of a, of a do-over, a start over. Here's the problem though. No matter how many times I started over, my ability never really changed. I never figured those games out. I could never do it. I was not good at them. And so I was always left with having the opportunity to start over, but under my own power, I ended up in the same place, dead, because uh, I was starting over, yes, and I had a whole new set of lives, but I still was only capable of so much. The idea of regeneration says starting over not under our own power, but under God's power. It's a whole new ballgame for us. We're now capable of things we've never been capable of before because God is making us able. Um, and so I love the idea of regeneration as a, as a start over, but it's a fresh start. It's a new start. It's a completely different start. It's not me starting over from the same old place with the same old power. It's me starting over with God. It's God starting over with me, in me, through me. And so the idea of regeneration is this idea of a new start, a new birth. That's what we talk about when we mean uh, being born again. Uh, the second uh, big word that, uh, 
that Bridges comes to is sanctification. Now, again, one of those uh, eight-cylinder words that Bridges talks about um, at the top of page 99, uh, 91, top of page 91, um, Bridges talks about how William Plummer, who was a 19th century Presbyterian minister, wrote these words. He says, regeneration is an act of God's spirit. Sanctification is a work of God's spirit con consequent upon that act. In regeneration, we become newborn babies. In sanctification, we attain the stature of full-grown men in Christ Jesus. And so the difference between regeneration, the moment of regeneration in our faith, and sanctification is that regeneration is a moment. It's an, an opportunity to start over, fresh, again, become a newborn baby in Christ Jesus, have life new in Christ Jesus. That's a one-time thing that's your that's that conversion moment that's that moment when we fully submit ourselves finally to Jesus Christ sanctification then happens after that it's the process of spiritual maturity becoming spiritual spiritually mature um, again a bit later in the chapter bridges is going to describe this as being the shift from uh, uh, living in our sinful nature to being um, submissive to the Holy Spirit's guiding and leading us in our lives. That's the big thing that happens in sanctification, right? The idea of sanctification, the process of becoming holy, if we consider it literally. Well, how do we become holy? Well, we'd have to submit ourselves to God fully first, to, to the Savior Jesus Christ fully first, and to the power and movement of the Holy Spirit in our lives fully, and then allow those things to work for us, the process of sanctification. Now, when we talk about sanctification, it's often difficult to talk about sanctification without bringing up another uh, big word in theology, which is justification. And justification um, is different from sanctification, all right, in this particular way. Justification was made possible for us at the cross of Jesus Christ. Sanctification is made possible for us by the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us. And so once again, justification is a single moment. It was the moment that Jesus won forgiveness for us on the cross. That moment will never take place again. Jesus will come back. He will rescue us. He will bring us home. He will defeat Satan. He will throw him into the lake of burning sulfur, into the lake of eternal fire. He will um, usher in a new heaven and new earth. All those things. But they will never be that moment on the cross where Jesus won our forgiveness. We were justified, made right before God in that moment on the cross. So justification is, again, a one time thing just like regeneration is we were regenerated when we accepted jesus christ as savior we were justified when he died for us on the cross and then as a result of those things we continue through this process called sanctification becoming holy now as a result of these two things uh, bridges suggests that there is um, uh, three things remaining for us to understand first is well, what's the goal of all of this? What's the goal of sanctification? What's the goal of, 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 of first having been re regenerated, then uh, justified and being working through this sanctification process? And then secondly, who makes that possible? Who helps us with that? And then finally, by what process does that person or thing help us? So, so what is the goal? Well, the goal is the title of this chapter, to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. The goal of the process of sanctification, sanctification, the goal of the one moment of regeneration, and the goal of the one moment of justification are all the same, that we would become more like Jesus Christ as a result of them. And so transformation um, is another word we need to talk about now in terms of these big theological words. Uh, sanctification can sometimes be called transformation. Uh, transformation obviously being when something transforms. It's made different. The, uh, the process of sanctification ought to make us different than we were yesterday. 
uh, different than we were two weeks ago. And so it, transformation is the process uh, that's happening as we are involved in this sanctification. The goal of that process is confirmation or being confirmed to, it be, to have been found in the likeness of Jesus Christ. And so that confirmation of the sanctification process obviously can't happen until we stand before God. When we stand before God and he says to us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. When he says to us um, that we, he, in, in us he recognizes his son Jesus Christ, then it is confirmed that we have walked through this process of transformation, of sanctification. We accepted uh, the gift of being born again because God loved us. We have accepted the gift of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of our sins. And then we have walked through this transformative process called sanctification that led us to a moment, glory to glory, where now we stand before God and it is confirmed. Yes, you have transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Um, the last two pieces then are the agent and the means. So who helps us to become transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ? And how does that person help us? Well, the who, of course, is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who helps us. He helps us through this process of sanctification. Um, and so at the uh, middle of page 96, uh, we get a little bit of a glimpse of... Um, of the, the first half of the means. If the Holy Spirit is the person, how does he do it? Um, look at page 96, middle of the page. Think of yourself walking into a room where the lighting is controlled by a dimmer switch. As you walk in, the lighting is dim and you see the furniture all in place, no newspapers lying around, no dirty cups on the coffee table. The room looks neat and clean, but as you turn up the wattage and the lights, you begin to see dust on the furniture, smudges on the walls, chips in the paint, and threadbare spots on the carpet. The room that looked all right in the dim light suddenly appears dirty and unattractive under the full glare of brighter light. This is what happens in the life of a person who's pursuing holiness, walking through that process of sanctification, that transformative process of sanctification. At first, your life may appear fairly good because you've been a decent sort of person and no gross sins are visible. Then the Holy Spirit begins to turn up the wattage of his word and reveal the more subtle, refined sins of which you were not even aware. Or perhaps you were aware of certain thoughts or actions, but had not realized that they were sinful. And this is a really powerful analogy of kind of turning up the wattage. Because, right, Paul, Jesus even spoke in these ways. He says that, um, you know, we must bring light into the darkness of our sin. Um, the, Jesus Christ, who offers forgiveness, must be the light that no darkness could ever overcome, John said. And so if that's true, when there's dark and we shine the light of Jesus Christ on it, um, it reveals to us uh, the, the true, uh, what, what's really happening in the darkness, the sinfulness. And so um, the goal is to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Who makes that possible? The Holy Spirit. How does he make that possible? What is the means by which he does that? Um, really, Two pieces to the means. First, um, God, God has to uh, work in us by the power of his Holy Spirit so that we can become transformed. God has to, um, God has to do that for us. He has to give us the gift. That's why, you know, Jesus, when he was ascended to heaven, he met with the disciples ahead of time and he said he was leaving behind a gift for them that they would desperately need, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, God has to work in that way through us. So there's a part on God's part to do. He has to work by the power of his spirit in us so that we can become transformed from that sinful nature to that Christ-like nature. But there is a part of us, uh, a part for us to do as well. We, as a result of the idea that God would be so willing to work in us by his spirit that we could be moved from sinful nature to Christ-like nature, 
we have to be willing to submit to the leadership, the movement, the guidance, the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives so that transformation can happen, so that sanctification can happen, so that we can move from the first glory, the moment of conversion, regeneration, and justification, to the second glory, the moment when we will be united with Christ and with God forever. Um, it's a really important chapter. There's so much more to it than just the, the, the sort of flyover that I've given you just now. But hopefully it helps you to better understand a little bit some of these big context words. And um, what's interesting, I want to give you a little preview for next week. The, the beauty of this particular book is it takes this idea of sanctification, this process, this transformation we undergo. And, and, and we, we've just talked a lot about it now, but next week... Where we're, gonna, where we're gonna end up is talking about obeying the great command. What, which is the great command? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And then the second, Jesus says, is to love your neighbor as yourself. We can't do either of those things unless we have first submitted ourselves to those first glory moments, regeneration, justification, the, the, the gift of being born again and the gift of being forgiven by the cross of Jesus Christ. And we cannot uh, submit ourselves to uh, or hope to obtain uh, living out this great commandment if we're not submitting ourselves to the process of sanctification all the way along. And so it's beautiful how these two things connect together. I hope uh, that you'll have a great week this week. I hope you think a little bit about the process of sanctification, right? which remembers that shift from sinful nature to Christ-like nature, and see if you can see some ways that that might be unfolding in your life this week. I look forward to meeting with you again next week as we will look at chapter 7 in Jerry Bridges' book. And until then, I hope you have a great week, a very blessed week. We'll see you then.